This election year is different, but don't let that stop you from voting. There's a lot at stake, like strengthening Social Security and Medicare, lowering drug prices, and protecting the health of you and your family. AARP is making sure you know your options for voting safely. Check your state's deadline for at-home ballots or early voting. If you're voting in person, confirm your voting location as your polling place may have changed. And take safety precautions, like wearing a mask, bringing ID if required, and sanitizing afterwards. Visit aarp.org slash election2020 to learn more. Tent Manager for the Center for Asian American Media. Thank you for joining us for Coping and Caring During COVID-19, Aging in Real Life and in Film, in conjunction with our presenting sponsor, AARP. It's hard enough during normal times to talk to our loved ones about aging and caregiving, but now with the COVID-19 pandemic and everything that it's brought, it's even harder for us to have these discussions with our elders and to help them to stay safe and healthy. So, and also for those of us who are taking care of parents as they age while also raising children and homeschooling, we have a lot to talk about today. So today's discussion, we hope will help add some clarity and give you some uh, ideas and help you to not feel as alone. We're gonna introduce our panelists. We have a slate of great experts and filmmakers, and um, I'd like to introduce them one by one right now. First, we have Daphne Kwok, Vice President of Multicultural Leadership and Asian American and Pacific Islander Engagement for AARP. Thank you, Grace. Uh, good evening to everybody, and AARP is so pleased to be able to once again partner with Cam, and uh, who has done tremendous work in telling our stories. So I'm Vice President of Multicultural Leadership, and I lead the Asian American Pacific Islander audience work for AARP at the national level. And I have the great pleasure of being able to continue to work in the community, help support the community, and really raise the issues that AARP addresses, such as caregiving or fraud protection. Uh, as uh, we all age, uh, it's something that we all need to address and talk about. And so we are trying to make sure that AARP is relevant to our AAPI community. And then also we want to really learn from the AAPI community, what are the issues of concern uh, that we at AARP should be addressing as well too. So I have a tremendous opportunity to be able to work internally as well as externally to continue to advance the AAPI community. Thank you so much to hearing more about that. Our next guest is Nita Prasad, who is a marriage and family therapist who works with uh, seniors and family services for the city of Fremont. Welcome, Nita. For having us here and thank you for giving me this platform to talk about what we do and how we serve the community here. So I am Nita Prasad. I oversee um, several programs in the Human Services Department of the City of Fremont. And uh, we serve the aging population group of, uh, we are a group of professionals, uh, diverse professionals, I should say. Um, and our services are provided in multiple languages, Mandarin, Spanish, Farsi, Hindi, Urdu, Punjabi. Um, so we support diverse community here. And, um, City of Fremont is very much a community partnership type of city. We serve the Tri-City area, actually, Newark, Union City, Hayward, Fremont. Um, so our services that are geared towards the seniors are several. I would like to talk about them later. Uh, but I oversee the counseling and the case management programs. So for the counseling programs, they are for example, senior peer coaching, senior peer counseling, family caregiver program, and then the case management programs help connect the seniors with multiple range, array of services, I should say, medical care, housekeeping, transportation, legal advice, money management, several different so the case matters then are out in the community supporting the seniors in their homes. In the COVID times, the way we are providing services has changed to some extent, uh, and we are doing more telephonic support. Uh, however, the case managers and the therapists are still meeting 
as is needed out in the community. So we are trying to take the needs of the community as much into account and keeping um, in view the public health guidance. Um, so our work is changing. Our, our people that we are serving, they are talking about their preferences and we are trying to take everything in, into account and still be as useful and assistive as possible. Thank you, Nita. Our uh, next introduction will be Seth Hernandez Vernquilio, filmmaker uh, behind Coverage, a documentary about healthcare. Hi, Seth. Thanks so much for having me, Grace. Um, hi, everyone. I'm the filmmaker behind um, Coverage that tackles the issue of healthcare access for undocumented adults. Also one of the co-founders of the Undocumented Filmmakers Collective along with Rahi Hassan. Thanks for having me. Thank you. We'll hear more from Set uh, once we get started into our conversation. Um, I, I'd like to introduce Mallory Ortega, another filmmaker behind the musical film, The Girl Who Left Home. Hi, Mallory. Hi, thank you so much for having me. I'm Mallory Ortega, the writer, director, producer, and lyricist of The Girl Who Left Home. This film features a family that is growing through the grieving process of a loved one and how first-generation Americans and immigrant Americans um, uh, come together and start to understand their different ways of grieving and moving forward. Mm. Thank you, Mallory. We're looking forward to hearing more about that. Um, and then uh, next we have filmmaker James Q. Chan, um, who is behind the documentary, You Are Here. And uh, James, tell us a little bit more about yourself and your work. Thank you very much, Grace. Nice to be here. Hi, everybody. Um, my name is James Chan, and I am the series creator of a new documentary series called You Are Here. And they are portraits from the San Francisco Chinatown community. And since the uh, demographics, the largest de demographics in Chinatown are the elderly residents, um, we have rooted the first season with their stories. Great. And along with James, we have um, another special guest who is part of your series, Dorothy G.C. Kwok. Let's bring Dorothy up with us. Hi, Dorothy. We can't hear you. Oh. Dorothy, turn on your Oh, there you are. Great. OK. I'm Dorothy G.C. Kwok. I'm the field producer for Good Medicine Film Company, working with James. Happened to he found me when he was filming in Chinatown while I was leading tours throughout the neighborhood. So I am feeding him information on what he needs for his films. Great, thank you. We look forward to hearing more about what you're doing, Dorothy. Um, so right now I'd like to transition into our first panel, which will um, talk about aging and caregiving in real life. So um, let's bring Daphne Kwok, Nita Prasad, and, uh, and Dorothy back uh, into our group. And right now, let's, uh, let's have a little introduction. Maybe Daphne, would you start us off by talking a little bit about what are some of the issues that make it um, specific to Asian American elders during this time? Are, are there things that are um, particularly challenging for our community? Well, especially during this COVID time period where the stay at home order and where the social isolation issue is a real concern to our elders. I would say, unfortunately, on top of all of that, uh, the xenophobia, the hate crimes, the assaults against our elders is really something very real as well, too. And so that's why we really, as a community, need to be very vigilant and supportive and, and helping out our elders. Um, the social isolation issue is really one that we're very concerned about. And we know that a lot of the community organizations are asking and seeking volunteers to especially make calls, to check in on the elders, to be able to help take food or groceries to the elders, because we know that they're very fearful during these times to actually step out of their apartments or homes 
uh, for fear of the assaults that are going on. So um, social isolation issue is one. Really also the need for food as well. Um, seniors and the hunger issue is very real in our community. We know that unfortunately a lot of these food banks that are providing foods to seniors are unfortunately providing foods that are not culturally relevant. You know, Asians don't eat cheese. Asians don't eat, you know, potato chips or, or raw vegetables. Uh, we want our rice. And so therefore, it's so important the community organizations on the ground that are trying to provide um, Asian foods for Asian diets uh, is really, really commendable. That Thank sounds you. like a great plan. Um, Nita, I know that Fremont has some really, really robust and vibrant programs for senior citizens. Um, can you describe what that looks like during normal times and maybe what that, um, what kind of shape that's taking now since we aren't able to move around and gather together uh, in person? Yes, um, so through Fremont Senior Center, for example, we are providing food to the seniors. Um, you know, they are also subsidized highly. We are also um, partnering with community and the organizations, you know, uh, that Fremont partners with. They are providing food, they are dropping food off at the seniors' home. We are working with even volunteers in the community. It's so beautiful. Uh, young people like Boy Scout group have stepped up. So not only they are uh, dropping food off to the seniors, but anyone that may be in need, um, you know, so it's, it's, it's like organizing the community around this very challenging and difficult time for the community at large, but especially the seniors that are isolated because even more so because of language barrier, because of poor health, because of uh, fear, uh, like how you were talking uh, earlier about, you know, um, hate crimes, or it could be a variety of different reasons. But the seniors that we are serving, we are also checking up on them regularly. Uh, what we used to do, for example, once a week uh, through our uh, counseling program, for example, now we have broken it down to like three times a week. Um, maybe the number of, uh, the length of the time we spend in one session, one hour, now we are doing, you know, uh, maybe one and a half hours. So we are changing the way wow. we're connecting with the teams also, check, doing more wellness check on them. Um, uh, so even if the mental health counselor would be calling the senior, they still check about like, okay, tell me about your food needs or other health needs or any other emergency coming up because we totally recognize with the COVID-19 social isolation especially for seniors that also had language barriers and were isolated even from before. Their children are not living with them or their adult children are, even if they're living close by, even the adult children, there was a time when they were not, you know, truly stepping out because initially when COVID-19 happened and we learned about it, there was so much of chaos and um, confusion around what is the right way to step out and do things. So, yeah. so I think responding to the chaos as a community really helped and city of Fremont, um, we quickly came together on a, um, in, as a mental health therapist, I'm so used to calling treatment plan, <laughs> but you know, advertising <laughs> around how to respond to these emergencies. So for example, the seniors um, center that also used to be a social a uh, recreational get-together place for the seniors. And COVID-19, that went away. However, right. yeah, I mean, it was a big change because a lot of seniors, we used to get like 300 seniors on almost like on a daily basis, lunchtime. They used to get together and play games. And so for some senior, that was the only recreation, social uh, connection that they were getting. It was a wow. It was a big change, really, and and very sad time. So so then it took us, you know, maybe in like a couple of weeks, 
but we started to move all the meetings and different things to go to meeting, for example. Okay. Zoom meetings I facilitate um, uh, anxiety and worry uh, workshop on a quarterly basis, but then other people are also doing other providers, uh, other volunteers are providing like yoga, you know, chair yoga and things mm -hmm. like that. So Great. it's really the community has stepped up from all age group, I should say, not just the seniors helping the seniors. So the senior peer counseling program um, is one of those programs where the peers, the senior peers have connected with the seniors over the phone and they address the social isolation, grief, loneliness, because we totally recognize during this period when people passed away, somebody lost their loved one. Mm. They were not able to meet their loved one. Oh, um, that's so, so hard. The hospital. Um, so, Dorothy, does this resonate? I don't know. Does, you know, you are a senior. I'm wondering, you know, does this resonate with your experiences or what you're seeing yes. in your community? It certainly does. In fact, I am a recipient of the many things that senior centers are doing for the community here in Chinatown. So I can relate to, to what Fremont is doing for their population of seniors. I am fortunate that I have friends and tenant neighbors in my apartment building who are supplying me with my groceries. Uh, every so often. And so I do not need to go out to shop. But I know there are programs that are here in San Francisco, Chinatown, that have provided free meals for all seniors. And filmmaker James uh, was one of the volunteers to pass out these uh, lunches on a daily basis. And when there was a surplus a couple of times, he dropped it off to me. So, nice. <laughs> so I, I have benefit in all ways as a senior, but I also am still active in the sense of uh, having enough energy and, and my time to be out in the community to keep me from feeling isolated. Mm. Even though I have been in my apartment, what, 205 days now, going out only uh, a few times for banking and for laundromat. And fortunately, again, James have taken me out on, on a couple of outings. Otherwise, I have been in my 480 square feet apartment uh, totally during these uh, going on what seven eight months right so Dorothy, you're very lucky uh, you're yes, so lucky I am. that you have a friend in James and that you know somebody to connect with and a younger person to to help right. you with things and also I am being checked on uh, with phone calls from the Community Tenants Association that I'm a mem member of here in Chinatown. So once a month I hear from them, and of course I hear from my my HMO uh, occasionally as well, checking on me. Great. But I, I'm still concerned about going out. And part of not feeling isolated is that I email uh, relatives finally uh, after couple of years of hiatus and also old friends that I'm reconnecting with. And even though um, it may only be email, sometimes there will be phone calls. So I'm keeping myself from feeling isolated as well as trying to, to check on other senior friends as well. Thank you. You're a role model. I really appreciate hearing from you and hearing how you're managing during these times. I wish we had more time to talk, um, but right now we need to wrap up this portion of our discussion and transition into the second part of our uh, conversation today, which is um, talking about how aging and caregiving is portrayed in films. And we've had several films during Campus Forward that 
deal with themes of aging or younger people who are taking care of aging elders. And I'd like to introduce our second group of panelists. We have filmmakers uh, James Q. Chan, again, Seth Hernandez, Ronquilio, and Mallory Ortega. Hi again. So I, I would like um, to hear from you about, um, you know, being fairly young people, how did you get interested in the topics of your films? Uh, maybe James, maybe you can start us off. Sure. <clears throat> when you say young people, I'm actually, change is inevitable. And so ARP will, will be knocking on my doors in a few years, so I'm not that young. <laughs> um, <laughs> How did I get involved in this this story? Well, I, I live in Chinatown, so um, I serve my community through film. And um, my Chinatown is is a beloved place for me. Um, it It's held and given my father a sense of community when we moved from Minnesota um, in the early eighties. and um, uh, he he found community. And so from my time hanging out in Chinatown with him through through middle school and high school going through Cameron House um, it it's it's visceral it's a visceral connection I've never met my grandparents so the elders in Chinatown are my my grandparents my grandparents like Dorothy, like Dorothy absolutely mm -hmm. she's she's a buddy and and also an, an incredible like um, team member of this project. Um, so yeah, that's that's how I got involved in telling stories from the community is that it's it connects me back to um, love letters to um, them for holding and giving space to my father. No, oh, thank you. Um, now Seth, your, um, your relationship to the topic is a little bit different in that um, you are interviewing people who are in, um, core positions in the healthcare struggle. Tell us about that. Yeah, thanks Grace for that question. Um, so um, my entry point into the conversation around um, aging and healthcare access is that um, a few years ago, I've been part of the Health for All campaign, the shirt that I'm wearing. Um, and the Health for All campaign is a campaign in California to expand healthcare access for all people within the state of California um, regardless of, um, of immigration status in particular. Um, uh, last year, there was a push to um, expand healthcare access for low-income elderly people um, who are undocumented. Um, we, we know that in, in the state, you know, and even in the country, a lot of elderly undocumented immigrants are so vital to our communities, you know, from farm workers, many of whom are like middle-aged to um, elderly, you know, and in coverage, what we highlight is an elderly caregiver, a Filipina a community member who herself is elderly in her 60s, um, and is a caregiver to elderly people. Um, her clients are 90 years and older, uh, but because uh, of her immigration status, she doesn't have access to the care that she herself provides to other people. Mm -hmm. And in so many ways, you know, it's kind of like a microcosm of um, how undocumented people are treated, you know, in, in this country. And I think um, when we talk about aging, I think it's also important to look at aging with the layer of um, uh, class analysis mm -hmm. and immigration status and race. You know, who has access to retiring? You know, so many undocumented people that are elderly in their 70s and their 80s are still working. You know, my own parents, you know, my own mom, you know, not having access to, to that privilege of being able to retire. How can we work together so that elderly people, regardless of their immigration status, you know, their, where they were born, you know, have access to um, a dignified aging process, you know, where they can, where, where they don't have to worry about how they're gonna, where they're gonna live, you know, because they don't have money to pay the bills if they do um, stop working. Yeah, so, such important conversations. Thank you for bringing those up. Now, Mallory, your film is a little bit different in that it's a very, it's a more lighthearted um, look at the situation and um, told through the eyes of a younger character. So um, 
Why did you decide to make that choice to have a, a younger woman whose life is impacted by, by caregiving and by aging? Um, well, for me, I think um, growing up family, of course, is just so important. And um, it's, it's just kind of funny, even right now, I am going through a loss in the family. Mm -hmm. um, and so we're watching uh, my film and grieving like going through this whole process again. And I think for me, I wanted to write this because I was really, it, when I wrote it, I was really questioning, um, you know, why did my parents, were, why were they so strict with me? Why did they limit so much in my life when I feel like now that I'm away from them, I have flourished into like a bigger, better person. And then it was more about discovering like and understanding their background and um, coming to an understanding in myself oh, this is why they treated me this way. And this is why we are so close as a family. And these are why the expectations of taking care of your elderly is so important because um, at the end of the day, all that you have is family. If you could take everything away from you, your family is what's left. Um, and so I really wanted to show the Filipino culture um, through that process. You know, I feel like in media, uh, Filipinos are always like the back end of a joke. Um, and I'm like, well, we're not a joke. Um, I'll show you why, you know, there's so much hardship within our relationships. And yet again, at the end of the day, we're still there for each other. And it's just such a complicated relationship between the younger generations and, and the older generation with that just minute cultural um, difference of being a Filipino American versus a Filipino in America. Um, and that is why I really wanted to tell this story. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. Um, I was wondering if you could each share one thing that has been um, surprising to you in the course of working on your films and working very closely with elders. Whoever whoever feels like they um, are ready to go can can jump in. I'll go. Um, yeah. Again, I think it's just because, again, my family is going through this loss and um, I was actually re really worried about some of us um, because my film actually just premiered in uh, the Los Angeles Asian Pacific Film mm -hmm. Festival a couple of days ago and none of them have seen it. And I was really worried about them feeling way too close to the material, even more so. But once I talked to them after they watched it, they were like, I learned so much about myself and mm -hmm. about the relationship with my grandmother who just passed. And it, it, it's just so funny that I didn't expect that at all. You know, I expected them to have a good time and oh my gosh, that was amazing. But um, I think after the making of the film, I just forgot that yes, I, I made this with an intention to impact people. Um, and I just didn't realize that that would be the reactions of my cousins and, and my family that again, even though there are hardships in the relationship, there is that learning um, cusp of life that you get nice. over and you move over and you move on and, and, and you want to put that good foot forward for the rest of your family and for the younger generation. Thank you, Mallory. And I'm sorry for your loss. Oh, thank, I'm so time. sorry. I didn't mean to bring that up. But <laughs> like <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I can see yeah. that. Um, uh, James, do you have a, a couple of quick thoughts about things that you've learned? Yeah, um, filming in, in, in San Francisco, Chinatown, especially with the community there, um, there's a specificity to, to the stories, mainly because culturally we are uh, told in our culture to not overshare. So we have elders who if you ask questions, it's it would seem as why are you asking? It's it's prying into my my personal um, uh, stories and and lives and to show emotions like that that is really not something that um, uh, traditional Chinese folks do. The, you're you're just told to literally just plow through your emotions. Mm -hmm. So one of the most surprising things, and, and it is a truly a gift, this whole process, is being able to sit, uh, build, a, build trust, and form a, a foundation around that trust and through communication. Mm -hmm. And then slowly them revealing their stories. And then I get to validate 
and acknowledge and hold that and then be able to then show it back to them and get their response. And for instance, is um, I, I took the, the film that's in the You Are Here series, the last episode is um, Master Simu Kuo. She is a headmaster over at Tai Chi, at the Tai Chi Academy that Dorothy and I go to. Oh, she nice. is, <laughs> she's in her mid seventies. And when she took over the studio from her um, husband, um, all the male students revolted. Most of the male students left because they didn't see that a woman could take over a studio, a martial arts studio. So she persevered. She got her own television show on KPIX teaching Tai Chi morning. Uh, and it's amazing. And so through the years, then she, she taught at San Francisco State University, published five books, and still teaches to this day. She's in her mid-70s. And to me, it's like, I love her. I love those stories. So, and yeah. I showed it to her the other day, um, last week, and, and she nodded and she said, not too bad. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we would all like to be like her when we grow up, right? <laughs> right, right, so that's a joy. Yeah. Um, Seth, what about you? Any takeaways from your experience working with elders? Yeah, for me, it's not so much a surprise, but I just didn't understand the fullness of it. Working on coverage, uh, following the leaders at the Filipino Worker Center, majority of them are elderly women who are immigrants, and they are organizing you know, within the state of California to expand um, rights for domestic workers, you know, caregivers um, across the state. And um, Emma, the protagonist, is also a board member with the National Domestic Workers Alliance. Um, one of our uh, uh, associate producers who connected me to Emma is a leader at the Filipino Worker Center, Tita Mirla Baldonado, also an elderly um, leader herself. I guess what I'm trying to get at is that we often underestimate the power of elderly people. Um, we often center organizing um, and activism stories around young people, millennials, Gen Z. Uh, and I think, you know, it might be important, and not might, it's important for us to uh, really recognize how elders, you know, are also have a vision for themselves and the world that they want to live in and, you know, how to, uh, you know, age, you know, with dignity. Um, and for me, being able to follow leaders within the Health for All movement, um, you know, domestic workers, you know, um, I think it really highlights how we need to do more uh, to amplify and uplift the stories and leadership of um, elderly people, not just as victims, you know, or like people that need help all the time. We do need to help our elderly people, but they're more than just that. Excellent. Yes. You know, there's so much, so much uh, vibrancy um, in, in life. And, you know, there's a wide range of um, experiences and it's nice to see all of the different people that we have uh, represented here. Thank you so much for sharing your stories. Um, right now, I'd like to bring everyone back on screen so we can have one final goodbye. Thank you, it's good to see you all. Thank you um, to all of you for taking part in this discussion. There is so much more we could talk about. I wish we had more time and that we could hear so much more from each of you. Um, but in the meantime, please make sure to check out Coverage, The Girl Who Left Home, and You Are All Here. They are all part of CamFest Forward On Demand. And if you are watching this, you can watch all of those movies through October 18th as part of your CamFest On Demand pass. And thank you again to our presenting sponsor, AARP. Thank you, Daphne, for joining us and telling us about all of the different services that AARP provides. Um, and you can find out more about those at aarp.org slash aapi. Right, Daphne? Oh, we can't hear you. <laughs> it's Thank okay. You so much. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you all for joining us. See you around. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.